Welcome, everybody. It's my pleasure today to introduce uh, Yulia Gell, and she'll be telling us about coupling time-aware multi-persistence knowledge representation with spatio-supra-graph convolutional networks for time series for forecasting. Yulia, please take it away. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much, Henry, for inviting me. And uh, I, when I looked at the slides just right now, I realized that I don't have my affiliation. And the reason is that I gave this talk at NSF uh, a while ago, and obviously I didn't put affiliation there. Anyway, so um, my home institution is UT Dallas, and um, I'm right, right now rotating uh, program at NSF. So this talk um, is a joint project with um, two of my postdocs, former post one is a former postdoc, another one is going out. So one is Yuju Chan. Um, uh, he's right now at Temple University, sorry, it's not Temple, Temple University, and joined with Princeton. And uh, Ignacio Segovia Dominguez, who is uh, moving now to Houston, Dallas, to uh, West Virginia, MAP department, and Boris Kashkunozer. So um, I, I need to say that I'm not apologist. Uh, although I started in PR map years ago, but I actually did ODE <laughs> and then I moved to applied math and went to statistics. So, and I had a course in topology, but I'm very far away from being a topologist. But I'm, I've been very interested in applied topological data analysis. So, some of the pieces in this talk I will skip because uh, you're all experts in that. Um, I just want to say a couple of things before I'll start is that. I was interested for the uh, last few years on um, how to do, uh, uh, how to incorporate multi-persistence into um, statistics and machine learning. And that was the first uh, project that we have done in this direction. So um, where we um, got some multi-persistence summaries and used them uh, to improve spatial temporal forecasting. And uh, this work has appeared in SLR last year. It's an uh, international conference on learning representations, and it was even selected as a spotlight. So I was very happy about it. Um, so um, let me provide a very brief uh, overview. I mean, what, how we started. So a couple of years ago, I would say more precisely three years ago, two and a half, there was a DARPA call uh, on uh, time aware machine learning. Okay. So uh, we tried to submit a proposal there, uh, and it was not selected. Uh, but it actually gave uh, rise to some ideas to think about. So essentially, most currently available machine learning uh, models are inherently static, in the sense that do not they do not systematically integrate uh, time evolving information uh, within the learning process. Um, and as a result, such models, they either need to be frequently updated um, or they will be limited um, to time evolving uh, environment. Um, at the same time, uh, as, as you all very well know, um, topological uh, information may contain some very useful signal, uh, complementary uh, signal uh, about the underlying data generating process and uh, it may improve not only performance of a deep learning model to say, but also robustness uh, of this model to various types of uh, attacks, adversaries, and, and, and so on. So in no way, and, and I need to say that I'm in statistics, yes? So in no way I would like to say that uh, topological information uh, will rule the world and everything that uh, we know about statistics shall be forgotten, but it, it contains some, some useful signal that shall be incorporated and then we may improve both performance and robustness of the learning process. Okay, so I'll skip this one for the sake of time because you all very familiar about this. And uh, since that was, uh, originally it was my NSF talk, uh, we run uh, weekly uh, not weekly, monthly colloquium series. So here you have NSF words and Ignacio has prepared this nice words to, to show how the works. 
So, so this is what I need to do to get funded. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, this is nice. Yeah. So I, I have an absolutely awesome bulldog who Ignacio who, who does all the different uh, types of plots, and we also have a project funded by NASA, and so he made NASA awards as well. <laughs> anyway, so I'll, I'll skip. Like, so this this one is general pipeline. So you have some data, then um, you you will have this. Uh, filtration of complexes, and then we'll extract topological summaries is one way rather we'll either kernelize them or we use a lot um, Henry's persistence <laughs> image in all various different forms, and then you input it into uh, a learning, learning model. So um, until I would say uh, two and a half years ago, we always worked only with a uh, single parameter of persistence. Uh, but there are uh, many, many situations uh, in real life, and in particular uh, in time evolving objects, um, where you may be interested in uh, more than one filtering function. Um, for example, if uh, we are trying to understand what are the anomalous uh, patterns on blockchain transaction graphs, and so if we're interested to identify money laundering schemes. So we may look at both volume of transactions and at the same time, number of blockchain transactions. So we we may filter graph uh, along both of these uh, genetic dimensions. The question is how to do it, yes? So uh, multi-persistence uh, has been around quite uh, for a while, but it's it hasn't reached uh, applications largely. Okay, so it's it's still somewhere in the clouds, and there are very very few papers who are trying to uh, assess the utility of multi-parameter persistence in uh, real life applications. I mean, there are some, but not 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 many. So uh, one of the I would say most uh, famous and probably one of the first approaches in this direction um is by Mathieu Carrer and Andrew Bloomberg where we try to do the slicing argument okay so essentially you project a multi-persistent uh, single dimension um and it is it is a nice idea but the problem is that uh it's very computationally expensive because you need to understand you need to select this um uh slicing in the best way and how you select uh, uh slicing may really impact your cells substantially so uh, since uh, we work with applications with statistical and machine learning models, uh, we always need to make sure that it is feasible, it's computationally feasible, because otherwise nobody will, <laughs> nobody will ever use it. So how to do that? So one idea uh, that we came up with was to use tools of linear algebra, okay? Uh, so there will be some sacrifices and some gains. So the idea was to um, define uh, euler poincare surface, or more precisely, dynamic euler poincare surface, because we're going to do it at each uh, time point separately. So suppose that you have a series of time-varying graphs. It means that at, time, at each time point, we observe a graph. Uh, it may be, for example, a blockchain transaction graph, or it may be, um, say, uh, classic one, one of the benchmark data that we use is California uh, traffic flow forecasting. So there you have locations in California and each timestamp you observe something at those locations. So it's a spatial temporal problem. So one way of uh, uh, addressing this problem is to use uh, traditional statistical tools. Or the other way is to create a graph representation. So at each time point, you may look at which locations are similar. So you need to define some measure of similarity. So whenever these two locations are similar, you create a graph, you can make edge between them, and then you create a graph, and it's a dynamic graph, okay? So uh, locations stay the same, but the edges between them change over time. Okay, so um, then we select two filtering function, uh, F and G, and uh, we'll run this multi, uh, persistence uh, analysis here. So, uh, and for each 
so uh, alpha J and um, alpha and beta J, well, those will be the thresholds uh, corresponding to F and G filtering functions. Uh, we we'll look at uh, the click complex of the new subgraph and define the corresponding Euler Farrakhan surface uh, characteristic for each cell. Okay. And then since we're doing it for each I and J, we're going to have M, M by N metrics for each time point T. Okay. So, uh, and that will be that, that sequence of time evolving M by N matrices will be our dynamic Euler form cursor. Okay. So this is a visualization of, of this idea. So we're doing for, uh, we compute essentially the characteristic for all the characteristics for each cell. Now, clearly we lose a lot of information from one point of view, but from another point of view, uh, it's a very nice, it's not like we lose a lot of information, we lose, we lose some nice properties. Um, um that we could have potentially more, more advanced properties on stability that we could have uh, achieved if for example we looked at slicing argument but at the same time we actually gain a lot because now everything is in this very very simple form it's just a linear algebra it's it's a matrix and uh we can do many many things with this matrices yes so we can um simply input it into statistical model, or we can view it as a surface and run some of our uh, seeing and deep learning models and so on. So it's, it's, a, it's a very simple object to deal with. So if we go along each of the dimension, for example, either along columns or along rows, we we'll have just the classical uh, single parameter per system. Now, the question is that, do we have any um, do we have any stability result? Okay, so ideally it would be nice uh, to have to say something about stability of this uh, Euler Poincare surface, dynamic Euler, Euler Poincare surface. And uh, again, so we'll base all the arguments on just uh, uh, linear algebra, yes? So Essentially, what we'll do, we'll define uh, the norm based either on columns or on rows. Okay, so that that will be our associated uh, uh, metric. And so that that essentially will correspond to something like, uh, say, for example, you would look at the um, Wasserstein one distance uh, between persistent diagrams along um, columns or along rows. Okay, so if you have two uh, um, two objects, yes, and so uh, with the corresponding Euler Poincare surfaces, I mean, corresponding to their uh, uh, multi-variate, uh, multi-persistence uh, filtrations, so the distance between uh, Euler Poincare surfaces will be defined just as uh, maximum over um Bessestein one distances over columns or over rows. Okay, so that's that's as simple as as that. And we call it a, just a weak L1 uh, metric for multi-persistence. And using this distance, it's actually relatively straightforward to show that uh, our uh, Euler Poincare surfaces will be stable with respect to this uh, L1 metric. Okay. Again, just based on the simple linear algebra argument. Um, okay, so uh, now <laughs> going to uh, how we integrated all of those uh, within the uh, deep learning method. So, um, as I said in the beginning, so our goal was um, to um, evaluate utility of multi-persistent summaries uh, for uh, spatial temporal forecasting. Uh, so, 
we you have a graph so that is your input data so that could be that graph uh knowledge graph that you created out of uh, spatial temporal data based on some similarity measures or it may be um yeah your data may come with, within the form of a graph, for example, the blockchain transaction graph. Okay, and then the whole uh, model contains uh, of uh, five uh, modules. So uh, the first module, okay, so that is a spatial graph convolution. It has nothing to do with um, multi persistence. It's just the idea is that uh, you try to uh, assess information. Uh, of your node along the surrounding nodes, and you do it not only the first order neighborhood, but potentially k hop neighborhood, uh, k k hops away from the target node. Uh, the second module was a feature transformation, uh, so trying to collect information uh, in a, from surrounding nodes. Uh, uh, the third uh, module is. Uh, Supra diffusion convolution uh, graph. So, since, as I said, since our goal is to do spatial temporal forecasting, uh, we look at the sliding window over time and we create uh, a tensor representation essentially of uh, over this uh, sliding window and the corresponding uh, supra Laplacian. So it's like a flattened version of a, a traditional Laplacian for this uh, 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 multi multiplex graph. And finally, uh, the module corresponding to time-aware multi-persistence. So uh, here, each of these slices corresponds to polar conqueror uh, surface along two dimension along two filtering functions. For example. In case of um, Ethereum blockchain graph, that will be number of transactions and the volume of transactions. And you can, uh, or it may be uh, power filtration and um, uh, say degree filtration or between us filtration together. Uh, in addition, we allowed the, the whole module allowed to look at uh, generally multiple multiple versions of um, multi-persistence. So here you may have, for example, functions f and g, f1, g1, and here it can be f2, g2, okay? So you can actually have ensemble of multi-persistences and incorporate all of them together. Uh, since uh, each of them, each uh, euler Poincaré surface is actually a matrix, so we can simply apply uh, CNN uh, uh, module, uh, seen a model to uh, to this Euler Poincaré surfaces. So essentially, we can view it just as a uh, image data on a grid. Okay, and then all of those together uh, integrated uh, into GRU model, and then you have a final uh, forecasting result. So um, if you, um, I'd say just a few highlights in terms of how different um, you know our architecture uh, here was uh, comparing to more traditional uh, approaches for um, deep learning for spatial temporal forecasting. The first one is that uh, we had that uh, normalized self-adaptive adjacency symmetrics. So um, at each epoch, uh, when you train the model, uh, we recalculated uh, similarity measures between uh, different uh, nodes and recreated a new type of agent depending on how similar uh, features uh, or embeddings uh, based on the each nodes uh, between any two nodes. And so that allowed to better serve the similarity uh, among nodes throughout the learning process. Um, the other uh, uh, I would say highlight of this architecture was that uh, we created the spatial graph convolutional layer where you could, uh, misrepresentation could be done not only uh, from a node to its uh, neighboring nodes, like just one 
uh, hope neighborhood away, but up to K hope, K hope neighborhood away. So that allows to assess that the gains uh, of nodes that may be even far away from your target node, but still contain useful information for the final learning process. Um, finally, uh, as I said, like uh, this sliding window um, uh, approach where, um, so traditionally uh, in statistics and time series analysis, you uh, the way how you model uh, data that are time dependent over time, so you have some version of uh, dependency, for example, weak dependency, yes. Uh, so what we have done here, <clears throat> uh, we run a sliding window approach and within the sliding window, for example, say seven days, uh, um, your sliding window. So we view all the data as a multi-layer network. More precisely, it's gonna be multiplex network because uh, nodes um, stay the same, but just ages change. Uh, over over time, okay, and so um, uh, so say tau that is a, a lens of a sliding window, and all of this uh, graphs uh, within the sliding window uh, is one of the layers, okay. And the interesting thing is that similarly to causal graphical models, is that <clears throat> here. Uh, data in the, for example, in graph at time point t minus one may depend not only on the preceding graph, okay, but it may be connected with any other graphs within the sliding window. So it may be that something on Friday uh, depend much more uh, on something that happened on Wednesday and even bypass something that happened on Thursday, okay? That's you know, more traditional statistical methods uh, cannot do that. Um, okay, so uh, so we created this uh, multiplex network and then uh, the associated, developed the associated supralaplation for that. And you see that uh, nodes within one layer may be connected to the preceding nodes, to any, any other nodes within this uh, multiplex network. Okay, so this is uh, how it's represented. So it's R power super Laplacian. <laughs> and um, uh, finally, we uh, uh, have done this uh, CNN based uh, time aware multi persistence uh, representation learning for oiler particular surfaces. So here uh, you can do, so as I said, like the input to, to this module will be this uh, euler Poincaré uh, with this matrices, yes, M by N matrices uh, with five filtrations. And then you can apply different types of uh, pooling. So global max pooling, global average pooling and so on. So pooling techniques in general allowed us to group some of information that is more similar and improve the learning process while uh, also enhancing uh, the associated um, computational code. And uh, then you combine all this information together and you have this final result for uh, forecasting, okay? So um, one important thing I would say, so uh, what's, what's the benefit of doing it this way? So first of all, uh, Looking at uh, at traditional spatial temporal statistics, we do not need to assume any type of dependence based on Euclidean distances. And in fact, Euclidean distances here may be not really appropriate distances to, to use. And traditionally in geostatistics statistics and spatial temporal statistics, we base everything on, on uh, Euclidean distances. That's that's first thing. Second thing is that you, your data can be uh, irregularly spaced. So you don't have any problems with, with this approach because we use a graph representation of, the, of uh, uh, spatial temporal uh, point clouds. So again, uh, you are, your data don't need to be in the grid, okay? And you have a very, in terms of multi-persistence, you have a very flexible approach of taking, uh, say, first of all, you can take 
different f and g at the same time and create an ensemble uh, of those uh, throughout the module and integrate with uh, all of them together. So um, how to, uh, to validate it? So what uh, we have done here, we have considered three types of data, very, very different types of data. So one, as I said, is uh, traffic, uh, California traffic data. Those uh, data sets are um, uh, benchmark, conventional benchmark for uh, deep learning models for spatial temporal forecasting. Uh, it's PMs, uh, PMCD3, PMCD4, PMCD8, but for those who are interested there, so PMCD2 and so on. So those, those are classical data if you'd like to validate anything uh, for particularly for GNN, but not only GNN models, generally deep learning models for spatial temporal forecasting. Um, we also have looked at Ethereum data. Uh, so those uh, three tokens, uh, Byton, Decentraland, and Golem. Uh, so here, for each of them, we looked at the 100 most uh, uh, active uh, traders and uh, Here's the information about number of average ages uh, over <clears throat> this time period. So um, uh, the data here were daily, daily uh, and we looked at the daily closing price and the goal was to forecast daily closing price. And uh, finally, uh, the last data set was COVID-19. So here uh, we looked at California and Texas so our uh, nodes were counties and um, uh, we created ages based on uh, similarities of uh, different counties. So in particular here, we looked at the uh, border connection. And um, the goal was to forecast COVID-19 hospitalizations. Okay. So those are very, very different data sets. So, uh, traffic data in California and COVID-19, those are intrinsically spatial temporal data where we just use a graph representation uh, for our model. And Ethereum, those are uh, data that come in the form of a graph, uh, dynamic graph from the very beginning. And uh, here the results are on uh, traffic flow forecasting. So, uh, this is our model and, uh, um, you know, competing uh, deep learning models uh, of different forms, LSTM, uh, CRNN, um, you know, deep state and uh, GNN, so many, many different versions. So this is one of our early models that based on zigzag, uh, zigzag persistence over time. Uh, uh, and um, Tom, uh, that is one where we incorporated this um, Euler Poincare uh, surface or within the learning process. And in most of the cases, ex in all except of uh, RMS E on uh, PMS, uh, PMS D3, uh, we got uh, improvement uh, comparing to uh, the next best model. And also, it's interesting, we also had. Uh, improvement in terms of um, standard deviation. Uh, standard deviations are not shown here, but this is something something quite interesting to me because the reason why standard deviation got a bit better is because, I mean, as a statistician, I would say it's explained that you kind of capture, you become more robust uh, towards uh, these types of uncertainty throughout the learning process when you incorporate uh, multi-parameter persistence within the uh, overall learning process. And um, here the results are uh, forecasting in terms of uh, uh, mean uh, average percentage error on Ethereum networks. And um, in all except of Vitam, we have, uh, you know, for Decentraland, we have a highly statistically significant result. And for Golem, statistically significant, and for Vitam, uh, significant results. Um, you know, the reasons, uh, again, so in all cases, uh, multi-persistence uh, helps um, in terms of improving forecasting results, but uh, this gains are different from uh, one data set to another, and that largely is dictated by um, 
you know, sparsity of original data. And um, I would say how rich the underlying topology of each of the token data sets. Uh, you know, if data generally, if, if graphs are close to being homogeneous uh, and, you know, exchangeable, so then, you know, you don't really need to run any of the topological methods because, you know, you won't extract, uh, I mean, it's unlikely that you'll extract something very useful uh, for uh, forecasting purposes. Uh, but if topology is richer, uh, then clearly, and if, if you've selected the uh, filtering function the right way, then it's likely that uh, that will help you to improve uh, performance, uh, forecasting performance. And, you know, those results for uh, COVID-19 hospitalizations uh, for California and Texas. And again, California, uh, California had the uh, lowest one, the lowest gains, uh, again, because uh, uh, data were, I, I would say they were more homogeneous compared to uh, Texas. And <clears throat> here are just some plots on uh, how each of the models, computing models uh, performed in terms of forecasting. Uh, COVID-19 hospitalization for each county. But something I think would be more interesting uh, for um, this uh, <laughs> audience is um, how much uh, multi-persistent helps versus uh, single persistent, okay? So um, what we have done, we, we kept, so we, we use a conditional approach. So you keep the same model Okay, so conditionally on this model, what if you don't use multi-persistence, but uh, you'll use, first of all, single filtration. And so uh, here you can do degree, betweenness, uh, power filtration, <coughs> for example, <laughs> number of transactions. Uh, so here's on uh, Ethereum token, decentralized, or power filtration based on volume. You can have multiple combinations for uh, multi-persistence, degree in between us, between us and power and, uh, based on number of transactions, between us and power based on volume, and, and degree, power based on transaction, degree, power based on volume. Okay, so the other, the middle part, is a filtration ensemble. So when you just stack them together, okay, so you don't do multi-persistence. You just do separately degree, uh, persistent based on single parameter persistent based on degree, single parameter persistent based on between us, and you just essentially concatenate them. So what, what do you get? Okay, so that, those are the results. And uh, to me, the results were kind of surprising. I mean, I, I really, I mean, it's amazing because it turns out that if you really do uh, run the more formal multi-persistence at the same time, you see how your um, uh, Topology of the data changes when you do uh, change across both dimensions. You have the highest gain comparing to all others. So, well, if you do this concatenation, you may do it slightly better than single parameter persistence. But really, doing doing more formal simultaneous uh, filtration across both dimensions uh, seems to be the best way to go. And most interestingly is that that is very stable in terms of a statistical point of view. So whenever we try to hit this data and create some kind of, um, you know, um, attacks, random attacks, intentional, intentional attacks, and so on, it turns out that um, the model that integrates multi-persistence is way more stable. It, it tends to sustain uh, uh, its performance much uh, longer than single parameter persistence or filtration ensemble based on concatenation. And that's actually not surprising because the amount of, uh, I mean, the amount of energy you need to invest in order to kill and to do something with multi-persistence is much uh, higher than what you need to do to, uh, to really uh, disturb the model based on just single parameter persistence. 
Okay, so and it's 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 even easier to disturb the final results if you don't have any any topological summary. Okay, so I, I wish that at some point there will be a more formal uh, statistical inference in terms of inference function and um, breakdown points uh, based on topological summary, but it, we do not exist yet. But this is some of the interesting interdisciplinary law. I would say maybe low hanging fruits, but you know lower hanging fruits than many others. Uh, because um, I think that one of the major things that topological summaries bring is actually robustness. It's not simply improvement of performance, but really robustness. Now, um, finally, uh, so uh, computational complexity. Because so I, I think that computational complexity was one of the primary um, issues uh, and roadblocks for bringing uh, multi-parameter persistence to statistics and machine learning and generally to applications. And so here you can see uh, various persistent summaries. Uh, so uh, multi-parameter uh, uh, persistence uh, based on uh, various types of um, uh, slicing argument. And our linear algebra approach, uh, just based on the matrices, so uh, polar point color surfaces. And uh, persistent images, uh, Henry's <laughs> uh, summaries based on single parameter persistence. So that is a degree between this and power. And of course, uh, you know, persistent images are much, uh, much faster, but they, they, they count only for a uh, single, uh, single filtering function. Uh, and we, uh, our oil parameter surface is substantially faster than uh, approaches based on uh, slicing argument. Um, now, so, um, so some of the key messages out of here. Uh, so multi persistence um, shows capability to capture some. Uh, latent time dependencies uh, of high dimensional interactions between um, uh, entities in spatial temporal uh, data or dynamic graphs um, much better than uh, single parameter uh, persistence. And maybe, you know, but some of those properties are inaccessible by uh, one parameter, uh, present homology. Um, also, uh, multi parameters uh, persistence is more stable against various types of adversaries in our uh, targeted attacks and uh, random uh, attacks on, on the data and the model. Um, and it's also likely, I, although we haven't done it, but based on, uh, it's, it's not in the paper, so, but, and I, I can't say that we formally, you know, explored that fully, but it seems that. MP uh, is likely to enhance anomaly detection process uh, that is, for example, uh, identifying some suspicious uh, patterns, uh, transaction patterns on blockchain uh, graphs. Uh, because for uh, blockchain data, one of the key issues is how, how you detect anomalous behavior is that you look at uh, high dimensional uh, multi-node transactions, because if, for example, we try to uh, do money laundering with Henry, it's not like uh, I will send money to Henry and Henry sends money to me, it won't, or, or to Patrick, it won't work this way because everybody will detect it immediately, yes? So we'll, we'll be able to, <clears throat> we shall be able to uh, invent some kind of um, uh, multi-node pattern that looks, from one point of view, it looks similar um, to everyday normal activity, um, but it's it's still you know allows us to achieve the goals of you know launder <laughs> to, to get some gains yes so but even if we are I mean even genius cannot really invent the new pattern all the time okay uh, a new scheme all the time so it means that the scheme will repeat itself in a while and if you think about what what is the scheme it's multi-node patterns yes so. This shall be, I mean, shall be at some point detectable with uh, persistent homology. Yes. So if you track various types of pattern over time, 
and you see some abnormal patterns, um, some holes that you know uh, that your attention. That may be a signal to be a money laundering scheme. And uh, before we have run similar analysis based on single parameter persistence, uh, and uh, particularly based on uh, volume transferred uh, between different uh, between different uh, actors in the blockchain transaction graph. But if you capable to devise uh, a method that accounts for both number of transactions and volume of transactions, such method will be much more uh, promising in terms of um, identifying malicious behavior uh, on blockchain. But I mean, in, in, not only on blockchain, but in general uh, financial transactions, but in blockchain in particular, because this data are freely available and everybody can go and test their ideas on, on, on this data. Um, now, at the same time, uh, as I said, we can go back and say, uh, yes, if, if we do multi-parameter persistence, uh, our results are going to be way more robust against, say, some adversarial uh, uh, text. So if someone tries to uh, disturb the model, disturb the data, um, MP is likely to sustain its performance comparing to single persistence, and single persistence is better than no topological summary at all. Um, now, uh, the uh, summary, MP summary based on this linear algebra argument of uh, William Horn Curry service seems to be a uh, very competitive choice because particularly for this time conditional um, problems, because uh, it has very competitive uh, computational costs. And at the same time, you still have uh, some reasonable um, stability result on that. Of course, they are, they are weak, but it's, it's, it's better than nothing. And uh, uh, it's, you know, still, I, I think that computational gains uh, overweight uh, that we have relatively weak uh, theoretical stability results in terms of weak metric. And of course, you know, uh, incorporating MP into the uh, deep learning, uh, as, as we've seen, uh, improves uh, forecasting performance. Uh, and I think that potentially could be done even uh, better, especially when you have um, uh, irregularly spaced data, um, very high, highly heterogeneous data. And uh, you're trying to complement more traditional ML and statistical tools with extra signal and MP is capable to deliver you this type of uh, uh, complementary signal. So, um, okay, so some future work. Uh, so what we were trying to do is uh, combine MP with zigzag persistence. And I'm generally very interested in zigzag. I find that zigzag has uh, a lot of potential <laughs> unexplored not only in uh, time-aware objects, but for causal inference, for example. Um, and it would be nice uh, to combine MP with zigzag in the following way, is that, so if you apply zigzag persistence uh, to time-aware data, uh, so, so time-dependent time data, you can pick up um, uh, topological features that tend, tend to <clears throat> persist over uh, <clears throat> your time window. Okay, of course, you that's for a fixed uh, epsilon, but still, you if you fix this epsilon, you see what are the features that exhibit the highest persistence over this time period. And that helps uh, for addressing such problems as transferability. Okay, uh, when you're trying to transfer a model, for example, of power grid resilience in Dallas to power grid resilience in Houston. It would be nice to have something similar <clears throat> for MP, where you can transfer again. So maybe some of the tools that you have developed for California and Texas, you can transfer to uh, for by civilian purposes to uh, New York or Florida or in between different uh, say, uh, tokens. 
So uh, that's something I haven't seen before, and I, I think that it has a lot of potential. Okay, so, and finally, I would like to thank uh, my co-authors, uh, Yuju Chen, uh, who's right now in CSN Temple, and um, last year he was in Vincent, he's still visiting scholar there, Ignacio Segovia Dominguez, uh, who has done this nice uh, videos, and Baris Kutpunuzer, who is my colleague from UT Dallas. Thank you very much. All right, so let's applaud. Okay. And uh, questions for Yulia. I have one. Um, yep. Uh, this goes back to the, the when you showed the, the slide with the model. Um, I was wondering, so the module three was the diffusion, the spatial diffusion um, uh, convolutional layer. Yep. And then the fourth was, what was the fourth module? Uh, force is okay. So force was supra. No, oh. no, uh, for, no, no. Force was this. No, no. Uh, third is supra. So that's you have multiplex network over time, and force was this multi persistence. Okay. So um, I, I'm assuming that those two were uh, to be input into the RNN. Yeah. Turned into a sequence. Yeah. So here's. So you see. <clears throat> uh, this. Okay, so this one, uh, so one spatial graph convolution and feature transformation, they go to GRU. And this two together, you know, so my, uh, uh, each uh, MP surfaces, yes? So they, they go into CNM, okay? And they, they th this two goes together. So uh, four, uh, three and four, okay? So the three and four are then fed into the recurrent neural network. Yeah. yeah. Um, I was just curious if you or had anyone ever suggested using a transformer instead of a. Yes, 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 yes. You can do a transformer. You can do a transformer too. Yes, yes, you're right. You know that their performance is usually better than RNNs. And yes, you are right. You need a you're lot right. more data. I, yes, I agree. Completely agree. Yes, yes, yes. I completely agree. It's, yeah. That, that's a good point. I mean, you can do transform as well. Actually, I I, I don't then. Uh, okay, so we have not really uh, compared to transform, honestly. And I, I cannot tell you right now why we haven't done transform. But I completely buy your argument. But yeah, that's, that's uh, yeah. I do know that like, the caveat is you need a lot more data to make significant improvements, but I'd imagine with like the blockchain data you would have. Chain, have yes, but for for COVID, it was not that, that many. For COVID, it was not that many. That'd be a problem, yeah. Yeah, that, 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 that will be, yeah. For blockchain, I agree. But COVID was really, it was, data was sparse and it's, all, it's, not, it's not much. So. Thank you. Thanks, yeah. I have a question that's convenient to ask now because it's on the prior slide, slide 12. Um, I think about stability. Yeah. So, um, okay, so the, the metric using um, sort of like a, a Wasserstein type metric on persistence, is that right? Yeah, it's very, very simple, okay? It's very, very simple. So essentially you do either column-wise or row-wise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it. And because if you do column wise, it becomes like a single persistence. You see what I mean? So it's like you're looking uh, distances. So for example, you, you look at column wise, yes, and you look at uh, distances between persistent diagrams along uh, along say <laughs> uh, say yeah uh, when you do uh, column yes you can rows yes the rows is changing and throughout this column, what is the distance? So it's like you are, it's not slicing, but it's like columns of differences between two persistent diagrams corresponding to the objects. You see what I mean? Uh-huh. Uh -huh. So you fix, yeah. So that, that was the idea. It's a very, very simple one. And then, um, let's see. So the, um, then 
do you have the same, uh, you know, it's a metric between two, two sort of uh, yeah. graphs, right? The, yeah. Do the graphs have the same set of vertices and same set of edges? Uh, I don't think we need to have the same number of vertices and edges. Okay, gotcha. I uh, yeah, you don't. It doesn't, doesn't need to be the same. It doesn't line. need to be the same. No, it doesn't. Okay. Cool. But it's, it's very, it's very, very simple. So essentially, you because you have, uh, you represent everything as a matrix. Yes. Right. So that's it. I mean, of course, I mean, with slicing, you have much better distances here. So it's L1. <laughs> it's, it's very, very basic. Yeah. So I fix uh, my row. Yeah. So for column wise. Yeah. So I fix my column and then I, I, I change everything across rows. Yes. And so that becomes just a single persistence. And then I, I, I go to the next column. I fix my column and I change everything in alone rows, yes. And then I look at the uh, max of the row of the columns, and that's it. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? I have a naive, naive question. I have a naive question um, about the data. So, for example, if you look at the blockchain case, you you have um, the nodes, and you said those are the um, the actors traders traders, traders. I mean. <laughs> now each trader so at an instant of time each trader makes a certain volume of trades and a certain um uh number of dollars of trades are those your two no variables? no no it's uh yeah everything is uh okay so uh if you are yes so everything through here so for example say we are trading yes between each other so yeah. we can see how many transactions we have. Yeah. At, at so, when, so whenever we, whenever we have a transaction, we have an edge. Yes. Okay. Okay. And uh, you can count how many transactions we had over a certain period of time. Uh, it can be age weight, but another age weight can be volume. How much we transfer to each other. So you you actually average over some yeah time yeah interval. yeah. Yep. The number yep. of transactions and the and yep. the yeah okay. yeah 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 oh, I see yeah so then and, you and this data available actually and we put this yeah. data available in a nice format so it's on Stanford Snap uh, database for networks so so then when you do the filtration you would say for example the volume filtration you'd say let's only connect edges that have a yes. have more than this volume yep. that's right mm -hmm. okay. that's right. Hmm. And the other question I had was, you used the Euler characteristic as your um, topological measure. Why not use Betty numbers? Or have you tried using Betty numbers, or does it matter? In sim yes, we have tried using Betty numbers. I mean, the, the Euler characteristic, yes, use just the alternating sign sums, yes, so for uh, for Betty okay. numbers. So yes, so we have run simply Betty numbers separately, Betty 0 and Betty 1. So you. Uh, if you only use Betty zeros or it's only Betty ones, it's worse than using both of them. But when you combine them, you know, it doesn't really matter whether you combine them through all your characteristics or as a separate. I see. So it's somehow the Euler gives you all the information about the different. Do dimensions. both. Exactly. When you do both. I see. Interesting. So not, not one. So we, we have done it simply for Betty zeros and simply for Betty ones. Yeah. We have, that, that we have done. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any final questions? Well, if not, uh, thank you so much, Yulia. I really appreciate it. And um, all the best. We hope to connect okay. again in the near future. Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me. I wish I could come in person. But <laughs> next okay. time. Okay, next time. Yeah, thanks very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.